It is a real joy to be with you all. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Josh Kelso. I came into the building this morning and thought to myself, I still know people. This is great. Oh, eight months since we have been launched out as a church. And there are definitely new people and faces that I don't know. And I wish there was a way to just know all of you instantly. But It just absolutely warmed my heart to be with you again. Uh, Julie and I, we really were raised in this church. We were part of uh, the church plant 20-something years ago, 22 years ago. We came over as, as basically children. I mean, we were 18, I think, not married yet, and married in this church and grew up in this church and discipled and pastored. And then, as I just mentioned, eight months ago, we were launched alongside of Tom Angstead and Tyler Azeltine for Gilbert Bible Church. And we took about 150 of the beloved saints here with us. And it has been just an absolute joy. And I oftentimes get asked, how is the church plant going? And I'd love to just speak to that for a moment. It, it couldn't be sweeter It really couldn't. And there's a little bit of internal conflict when answering that question, because I feel like if I, if I answer truthfully, which is that it's awesome and we love it, I feel like it communicates as if something was lacking or missing here. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Every single one of us loved and still do love Grace Bible Church. And so the joy and the, the encouragement and excitement that we're experiencing as part of Gilbert Bible Church isn't a testimony to something lacking here. It's actually the opposite. It's a testimony to the way that we were loved so well, discipled so intentionally, and sent out so robustly from this church. And so on behalf of Gilbert Bible Church, thank you and greetings in the Lord. It is great to be with you. The Lord is uh, just doing wonderful things at Gilbert Bible Church. As I said, we uh, were launched eight months ago. We've been at Discovery Community Church at Lindsay and Ray for the last, I think since August, the beginning of August, meeting there on Saturday nights, and they could not be more hospitable. It's been a wonderful relationship with them. Sometimes you don't know how those relationships are going to go until you're, um, you're with them and experiencing kind of week by week life together, and they've just been so kind and so generous and so hospitable to us, and Um, We are enjoying life as a small church, the intimacy of knowing each other really well and fellowship gatherings and small group ministries that we have has been wonderfully encouraging. We launched in the fall EQ, which is our equipping men and equipping women ministry, which is very similar to Build and Wellspring in many ways, where we put in front of our people the disciplines of shepherding your heart and intentional shepherding care and faithfulness in the home and faithfulness and ministry and Uh, That's just been going just uh, wonderfully, very encouraging. We had our first membership uh, Saturday as a church and welcomed, I think it was it 15, is that right? Something like that, around 15 uh, new adult members into the church and we're starting classes here in a few weeks uh, for our second round. And so it's it's just sweet. We're, We're a young church, we're a baby, we're a big baby. And thanks to you all, we're a mature baby. Body life as a church has just launched immediately. And I can't help but with gratitude, just think back to 20 years ago when there was Tom and Scott Maxwell, and they just committed themselves faithfully. And then uh, Scott Demarest came and other elders were raised up, Jacob and, and others as well, Eric. And they just, you know, hand to the plow, faithful discipleship, intentional care. For Scott to be committed to discipling me for as long as he did just shows perseverance and endurance and patience and trust in the Lord. I I was not an easy case and uh, and just so grateful, just filled with thankfulness. It's such a joy to get to be a part of, of what the Lord is doing. And that's a testimony to the leadership here, to your pastors, and to you all. So, Thank you. It is, uh, it is a joy and privilege to be, to be back here with you all. So, all right, with, uh, with those things in mind, go ahead and open up your Bible to the book of Philippians. We've been working through Philippians as a church over at Gilbert Bible, and I wanted to share something with you this morning from God's Word that was particularly impactful, and not, not by way of, of new ideas or concepts, but significant ones. Uh, 
really eternally significant ones and, and practical on how we live our lives. And the reality is I have benefited greatly from this church's commitment to godliness. There is an insatiable love for God's word and desire to be obedient and to honor him in all things. And this has produced much fruit. This morning, I want to just direct our attention to a precious two verses from Philippians that hopefully comes to you by way of encouragement uh, simply in what God has been doing in you all and by way of encouragement to excel still more, uh, not as a way of rebuke. Because you guys live this, you do this faithfully, you look to live holy, godly lives, you intentionally pursue godliness and desire God's sanctifying work in your life. And yet there's always occasion for us to pedal to the metal still more, pursue godliness with greater vigor, with more intentionality. And understanding these verses will be a great aid for us as we persist in pursuing lives that glorify and honor our great Savior, Jesus Christ. So this morning, we're going to be looking at verses 12 and 13. However, this discourse of instruction from Paul in Philippians chapter 2, it actually begins in chapter 1, verse 27. And I want to help set the stage of our verses this morning by way of brief review. In chapter 1, verse 27... Paul gives the first command that's found in the whole book, which is to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. And what follows this command is support of this instruction. And Paul in this command is directing the Philippians to live a life in keeping with or in balance with or consistent with their identity in Christ. And do this. How? Well, he goes on to explain that. By standing firm and being united with each other in selfless consideration of each other's needs over yourself. Do this with humility of mind, looking to Christ as the ultimate example. And then in verse 6 of chapter 2, Paul takes us on this glorious ride as we, as we ascend the heights of the glory of God in the gospel and what was accomplished by Jesus in his taking on flesh and humbling himself. He experienced death. He humbled himself even to the point of death. And not only death, but death on a cross. Yet he rose. And what is true now of Jesus is that he has been given the name above every other name and is at the right hand of the Father, highly exalted. And what is coming for Jesus is a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Oh, for that day. And then what happens is really interesting what Paul puts before us in our verses this morning. Paul descends from the mountaintops of the glory of Christ and enters back into everyday life for the Christian. How to live for Jesus today. How to walk in accordance to the work our Savior has done on our behalf. And what is so compelling is, is what Paul dives into is in the context of the local church. Believers instructing them on how they live with each other, how they live unified corporate commitments to individual spiritual growth together for the glory of Christ. So let's look at our verses for us this morning. We're going to look at verse 12 and 13 of chapter 2. Paul writes this, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. On these two verses, we see two critical components of the believer's spiritual growth. Two critical components of the believer's spiritual growth. The believer, the, the Christian, every Christian is called to a life of holiness. To be holy as God is holy. To grow in their faith. To grow in their Christ likeness. And there are two critical components that must be present in order for this spiritual growth to take place in the life of the believer. These crucial, necessary, indispensable components 
to the believer's spiritual growth are what we are going to see put forth before us this morning in our text. And the glories of Christ in the gospel, the love of God for sinners, is not just intended to be a message to make believers feel good about themselves. It is a radical, life-giving eternity-altering, redeeming, life-transforming reality for all who believe where you are pulled out of your rebellion against God. You are pulled out of spiritual condemnation and you are brought into fellowship with the living God to be used for his purposes, having the privilege to live for his glory as you are conformed more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And yet, how does this work? How does this come about in the life of the Christian? How does this take place? And this has actually been debated for decades. Many will submit to and understand the reality that in our salvation, God is the active agent. God initiates through his saving work. As one is brought by the grace of God, working through the gift of faith from death to life. How can someone experience eternal life? Well, they must be reborn, is what Jesus tells Nicodemus. Regeneration takes place through the power of the gospel, and you are brought into the household of God through the sacrifice of Jesus. It is God's doing. God in his sovereignty saves the sinner out of their life of rebellion and reconciles them reconciles them through the imputed righteousness of Christ, where Jesus took the punishment that each one who has believed upon Christ deserves, and then that one receives Christ's righteousness as a free gift. And now that sinner, uh, that one who is only an offense to God, who is under God's condemnation, who is a rebellion against God, at enmity with God, a helpless, godless sinner, that's what each of us are apart from Christ, is viewed through Christ's righteousness. Possessing Jesus' perfect righteousness. And this salvation experience is truly wonderful, but where is the believer to go from there? What, what transpires, what is to take place after that work of God in the gospel to transform a life and to regenerate someone? Well, Paul, as he has called the believers to walk in this salvation that they've been giving, given, he, he puts forth a, a wonderful, succinct summary of the Christian life. These two verses put forth, as we said, two critical components of how the Christian grows in their faith, grows in godliness. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, speaking of these two verses, said they are one of the most perfect summaries of the Christian life to be found anywhere in all of the New Testament. And within these verses, we get a concise summary of what is referred to as progressive sanctification, being made more and more holy in practice over time, progressively. And progressive sanctification, this is the process of, of true biblical change taking place over time in the believer's life. It's becoming more holy over time. It's growing in godliness. When saved, you are justified. You're credited with Jesus' righteousness, yet God has intention for believers to be made more and more holy over time until the day when we either depart this world through death or when Jesus returns and takes us to be home with him. At that moment, whether we depart in death as a believer or Jesus returns, we will see Christ, we will be like him, we will sin no more. But until that day, it is a, a process that God produces in the life of his children. You see, all of us who are in Christ are in a, a process. We are in this progressive sanctification time. We are all a work in progress as we seek to grow in reference to our salvation. The goal is holiness for the glory of God. How do we get there? Well, two critical components will aid us in our pursuit of godliness. And so let's jump in to the first one. The first critical component to the believer's spiritual growth is this, number one, the active work of the believer. The active work of the believer. That's the first critical comp component to the believer's spiritual growth that we see in this passage. 
And we see this in verse 12, the active work of the believer. Now, Paul, divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit, starts this section with such a clarifying statement. Look at verse 12 again. He says, so then, my beloved. Do you see that there? The word so then actually links what Paul is about to say with what he has written prior. That means that this exhortation where we're about to see it flows logically out of the truths of Jesus that were just presented. Christ embraced a specific mindset. Christ fully submitted to the Father. Christ submitted his will to the Father's and obeyed completely. So too must we embrace this kind of life of submission to the Father in humble obedience. So then, and then Paul says, my beloved. And here we see such a a heartwarming, compassionate address from Paul. This love that he possesses toward the believers in Philippi is evident. And you see this heart of love for these saints throughout the entire book. But this is also helpful to note for us that Paul is speaking to Christians. He's speaking to those who are in Christ, to believers, to people who have been saved by the grace of God. And some have balked at this passage, not wanting to minimize the sovereign work of God in salvation. As if you must work for your salvation. That's what they're guarding against. But we don't need to fear that here. As Paul makes it clear, what he is about to put forth is not a prescription. It's not a means for attaining salvation. But rather instruction for living in light of the salvation that you have received. And so Paul begins with, so then my beloved, and then the main verb or the main command in verse 12 is found in the instruction a little bit further down where he says, work out your salvation. Do you see that there? And we'll come back to the preceding clauses, but I want to look at this primary command to work out your salvation as the surrounding clauses actually will unpack this command more for us. Paul says, work out your salvation. And this call to work out is to to work on to the finish. Work out to the finish, to work work fully, to, to perform a task, to work to the finish that which God has put in us. And notice he doesn't say work for your salvation or work to keep your salvation. That's not on his mind at all. This is a call to simply live out or live in accordance or live in balance with or live out to the fullest degree or to completion, the salvation that you have been given from God. And remember, he's continuing his instruction on how to live in a a manner worthy of the gospel. And this command is in the present tense meaning every moment of every day we are to be working out our salvation. Uh, Many of you enjoyed a Christmas break this last week, a Christmas break vacation, a a time to unwind or relax, take a break. And there is never a taking of a break of this command. There's never a, a pulling back from this call to work out our salvation. This is to be continually present in the life of the believer. There are no days off for the believer in seeking to grow in Christ or to live in accordance with the gospel message and salvation that they received in Jesus. This isn't an event to be accomplished and then move on from. Every believer, until they are home with Christ, home with the Lord, is to continually and consistently be working out their salvation. And this command is an active one. It's for you to do, for you to apply yourself toward. You must choose to work out your salvation. No one does this for you. You must crucify the flesh. You must flee immorality. You must choose to reject temptation. You must choose to take the way of escape as you work out your salvation. Oftentimes, we respond to sin with this hopeful expectation that it will just go away naturally or conveniently in our lives. Maybe even in small group, you confess your sin and you ask for prayer with your sin with the hope that you'll respond better next time. Well, 
What are you going to do to change? What are you going to do to put that sin to death? What are you going to do to crucify your flesh? What are you going to do to cultivate and pursue holiness of life? How are you going to get to work at your salvation? That's what each one of us is called to. God has given us a new mind. We are called to put it to work. God has given us new initiative, new desires, new, identity, new identities. We are new creations. We are called to put it to work for his purposes. The part of our growth in grace is to work out. It is to expend energy in living the Christian life. To get to work. And the call is to work out successfully your salvation to its furthest extremities. Paul loves this truth of growing in holiness. And we know elsewhere he makes crystal clear in Romans 4, 5 that salvation comes to the one who does not work but is a gift from God. There's no working to gain your salvation. Don't, don't mishmash this. We're not talking about obtaining salvation here. There's no form of works righteousness that makes you acceptable to God. That God would accept or grant salvation to someone because they were good enough. They tried hard enough. They worked diligently enough. But for all whom God has granted salvation to, they are to get to work at living in light of this great, great gift that they have received. Now back to the first part of the verse. Look again at verse 12. Paul says, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. What a sweet, encouraging statement. Obedience has been the pattern of the believers in Philippi. They've walked in selfless, loving relationships and experienced the joys of unity and holiness. And while Paul longs to visit them, he is uncertain what is ahead of him. And as he awaits the conclusion of his imprisonment and the trial that he faces, he gives to, this, gives to them this encouragement to press on just as they have been characterized by obedience. Now much more in his absence, they are to continue and to obey. Paul is saying more of this same kind of obedience is to flow out of them. Paul understands the difficulties they are facing and the unique challenges before them. Paul has already at the end of chapter 1 acknowledged they are experiencing the same kind of persecution or conflict he's experiencing for Christ's sake. There are false teachers at the beginning of chapter 3. There's even, in the midst of their pursuit of obedience, there's even division among them taking place in the beginning of chapter 4. And so Paul says, ramp up your obedience all the more as I remain absent. And ultimately, what we see here is that living a worthy walk or living in light of your salvation, working out your salvation is expressed by obedience to God. What is, it, what is Paul getting after in working out your salvation? What is Paul getting after in this? Obedience. Submission. Every step forward in the Christian life, in your walk, in your relationship with God, is to be done on the path of obedience. And what Paul has in mind here is not some abstract obedience to a feeling or an impression but obedience to the clear, revealed word of God, to scripture, to truth. Your progress in your sanctification is through obedience to the word of God. It is growing in godliness through a yielding and submission to God. This is so important when thinking about our progressive sanctification. Sanctification is not simply participating in spiritual activities. Being at church, attending small group, even doing daily reading of your Bible, emotional experiences where you feel really close and connected to God. Knowing things about God or about spiritual things is not equal to sanctification. Being able to talk shop theologically is not equal to sanctification. Humble, submitting 
obedience to God for the purpose of him being glorified. That is the goal. Humble submitting obedience to God for the purpose of him being glorified. And so the Christian in humble obedience and worship reads their Bible. They want to know their God. They study the word, prays, fellowships, serves, flees immorality, pursues godliness. And listen, if it, if it were easy to grow in godliness, we'd all be much further along. It's not an easy task. It takes intentionality. It takes thoughtfulness. It takes self-control. And so this is a call to embrace all of the commands of Scripture for the believer in the New Testament. To take up your cross, to deny yourself, to pursue Christ, to love one another, to love your enemy, to speak truth and love, to lay aside falsehood, to let no unwholesome talk Come from your mouth to imitate God, to do all things without grumbling and complaining, to flee sexual immorality, to lay aside encumbrances, to set your mind on things above, to crave the word of God, and so on, and so on, and so on. And to obey the commands of God, to work at them, requires that we know them. And so we, we read our Bibles, and we study We give intentional thought and time to these things. And why is is obedience so important? Why? Well, this is how you imitate Christ. Look at verse 8. Speaking of Jesus, says, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Christ Jesus, he humbled himself, even to the point of death, death on a cross. Are you ready to give your life to God in obedience, to humble yourself before him, regardless of the cost, to imitate Christ? We sang a wonderful song earlier, Jesus, I, my cross have taken. This is the call from Christ. If anyone is to come after me, he must what? Deny himself, take up his cross daily. It's the call for every believer to die to self, to live for Christ, which is so much, so much better. Lastly, in verse 12, Paul says, work out your salvation. And he says, with fear and trembling, with fear and trembling. There can be a tendency in all of us to become complacent in our spiritual growth. Maybe you found victory in a specific area of life. You're encouraged by that, and that encouragement leads you to a way of justifying or rationalizing other sins in your life that you know are still present. Look how good I'm doing in this area. Or maybe you have a sin or sins that are lifelong struggles, vices, and you feel defeated in those and are in essence giving up. Why even bother? I just keep falling back into these same habits, these same routines, these same sins that are an offense to God. And you feel hopeless in those things. You feel defeated, overwhelmed. Maybe you find yourself disheartened because you keep falling back into the same old sins time and time again. Why am I doing this? I've committed so many times that that was the last, and then I go back to the same old sin. Listen, keep fighting. Keep fighting. Out of love for God and a right fear of sinning against Him, fight your sin. Fear God more than you fear your sin. Fear God. Fear is fright or terror, and trembling is shaking or to tremor. It's like me before I have coffee in the morning. It's an appropriate response in our seeking to be obedient to God. That we would not want to sin against him. And this fear isn't of condemnation for the believer. Don't misunderstand that. This isn't a fear that you might remain still under the wrath of God. 
There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, but this is a, a, a sincere desire, a fear, uh, an angst that you wouldn't want to sin against God. He's holy. He's good. He's righteous. He's pure. He's just. I don't want to sin against him. This is a, an appropriate response in seeking to be obedient to God, that we would not want to sin against him. We know from Proverbs 1, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And from Isaiah 66, that the one to whom the Lord will look is the humble and contrite of spirit one who trembles at the word of God. There is to be a fear and trembling in the believer seeking to grow in the Lord. That, that they would be terrified, that we would be, that we would be terrified of sinning against him. To think that we've been forgiving been forgiven of our sins. And so there's complacency in how we live our lives because what does it really matter? Jesus paid the price, reveals a lot of wrong thinking. Our love for God in response to the forgiveness of sins that he has poured out upon us should spur us all the more, instill in us all the more diligence over pursuing godliness. And fear over sinning against him. There is to be fear and trembling in the believer seeking to grow in the Lord. That they would be concerned, terrified with sinning against God. And this, this leads to a healthy distrust of self that isn't leaning on your own understanding. You, you fight and you work to have a well-informed conscience that isn't merely trying not to sin, but is eagerly and intentionally seeking to honor God through a life of holiness. Have you ever sought to get as close to the line of sin as possible without crossing it? What, what material is okay to watch, but doesn't, necessarily equal sin? How close can I get to that line of, of sinful things? What, what types of things can I do with my girlfriend before it crosses the line and, and then is sin? How close can I get so that I can enjoy and gratify my own desires and yet not cross the line into sin? Because I wouldn't want to sin against God, not enough to run away from sin, but I just don't want to cross that line. Have you ever taken that approach to fighting sin? It typically doesn't go well. Growing up, one of my younger sisters, and I have five, so I can speak discreetly. One of my sisters was terrified, five younger sisters, wouldn't want to make, if my older sister watched this, she'd be so offended. But no, five younger sisters, I have six sisters. One of my younger sisters was terrified of, of dress-up characters. So you go to Disneyland or something like that, the Mickey Mouse, the Goofy, terrified. And uh, especially we were at SeaWorld once, and there was a giant Shamu. <laughs> she, I was holding her. She didn't even want to look at Shamu. I mean, he was like 100 yards away. Look! Ah! She tucked her head in my chest, and then you'd kind of like... Do you see him as a loving big brother? Do you see him? You still don't know. She'd be all fearful. That's how we should view sin. We don't even want to gaze upon it. Keep us as far away as possible. I don't want to get close. That's how we should be with our sin. This fear. And listen, this is our sin, Right? We're talking about our sin. This isn't some sort of holier than thou. I'll never interact with somebody else who sins. That's not at all what we're talking about. We're talking about we should want to get as far away from our own sin as we possibly can. That we would not sin against God. This fear and trembling springs not of fear of condemnation, as I said, but, but from a heart of worship. Love for God. This emphasis on holiness is oftentimes met with a concern about legalism. Uh, don't you think you're taking this holiness thing a little too seriously? Sounds legalistic to me. You don't want to watch these things. You don't want to speak this way. You don't want to go do these things. That, mm, 
You really want to be at church? You really want to go to small group every week? This sounds kind of legalistic. Listen, we're not talking, again, about obtaining favor through righteous deeds positionally before God. That's legalism. If you think you can get to work at your salvation so that God would accept you, that's legalism. This is love. If you love God, what will you do? You keep his, obey, his commandments. You obey. That's what God has said. And, and we love him. We want to please him. We want to honor him. We want to glorify him. And in fact, he wants what is best for us. So there's a, a humble submission and trust that when I'm obeying, I'm not obtaining some sort of spiritual super Christian status. I want what God wants for me because I trust him that it is the best. And so I yield and I submit and I obey out of love. Not out of obligation to appease some sort of judgment that he might bring if I'm not good enough for him. Our salvation was never based on if we were good enough for him. None of us were. That's why we need the gospel. That's why Jesus had to come. That's why he had to give his life as a sacrifice. Now, if this was all that Paul had to say, it would be really overwhelming and really disheartening. Wouldn't it? Go get to work. Go do better. Go be more holy. If that's all we heard, I think every one of us would just go with our head hung out of this room this morning. But that's not all that he has to say. Each one of us has a responsibility to work out our salvation, and yet not one of us can do it in and of ourselves. And that's where we see the second critical component to the believer's spiritual growth. The first critical component, we saw the active work of the believer. The second critical component, here we see the divine enablement from God. The divine enablement from God. That's our second point. And it's the second critical component of the believer's spiritual growth. First, the active work of the believer, and now the divine enablement from God. While you are intentionally working out your salvation, we can have the comfort and the confidence that God is at work. We don't have to conjure up our obedience in our own strength. Look at verse 13. Paul says, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In chapter 1, verse 6, Paul already put this principle in front of the Philippians when he shared with them his confidence that the one who began a good work in them would perfect it, bring it to completion. God gives to the believer supernatural resources, empowering resources and enablement to obey. Paul is giving us two sides of the same coin here. In verse 12, the believer is called to growing in godliness as they intentionally get to work in their sanctification. And in verse 13, he flips the coin over and we see that in the believer's efforts to grow, they are being empowered by the strength of God working in them. This should come as a great comfort to each one of us who are in Christ. In salvation, God is the sole worker. There is one agent working, and it is God. God has done it all through Christ to make a way. Even your faith isn't found within yourself. It is a gift from God by the grace of God. In sanctification, there are two agents. There are two agents. The believer is called to get to work, and God provides divine enablement to do this. In verse 13, Paul says four, and this four is really the reason why he can give the command in verse 12. Work out your salvation. Why can you do this? For God is at work. The believer can be and is expected to work out their salvation because it is God who is at work in them. And you can see the relationship in Paul's work words in verse 12. Work out your salvation. And then verse 13, God is at work. In you. There's a continual presence and activity of God in the life of the believer, every believer. And take heart. No believer is overlooked. 
No believer is overlooked by God's enabling power. No one is shorted in this. No one gets the small straw and misses out on the power of God. And yet every believer is called to get to work. God provides an ongoing, continuous working. And just think about this for a moment. In every moment of temptation, every moment of temptation, you are never alone. God is always right there with you and you always have available to you what you need to be holy before him. God is present and active in and among his people. What a comforting, emboldening reality this is. It's important to remember the relationship of verse 12 and 13. Some would advocate for a belief or an approach that would say, God is working in you, so back off and let him do his thing. Uh, Don't focus so much on your sanctification. You're working too hard. Let, Let go, let God. Don't work because God is at work. And Paul says, get to work for the reason that God is at work. God's working in you doesn't let you off the hook of working on your holiness, but it is to motivate and to complement and enable and empower your pursuit of holiness. You can step forward actively in your spiritual maturing with a confidence Because you know the strength to do so isn't confined to yourself, but you are being enabled by an omnipotent God. You see, God's being at work in the believer doesn't make our efforts unnecessary, but it actually makes our efforts effective. In this, God gets the glory for our sanctification because he empowers the growth. Divine provision is enabling human effort. We're to work hard on our spiritual growth with a humble dependence upon the strength of God to give us what we need to be successful in this endeavor. If you're a believer in Christ, if you've come to him in faith and repentance, you have walked through the narrow gate and you are on a narrow path. The path is tightly defined by God in his word where you live in obedience to the word of God because God has put it in your heart and and that is the heart of the Christian to walk in obedience, to glorify God, to please him. And so while the believer is responsible for their obedience, in that obedience they are utterly dependent upon the work of God in them. God's work is ultimately behind, his power is ultimately behind every act of obedience as well as every desire for obedience. We get there by God's power, by God's enablement. God makes us willing and God makes us able to walk in godliness. And this is good news for us. We step forward to obey God's word, knowing that the very inclination to do so arises because of God's initiative within us. God's provision is never inadequate for whatever you are faced with. He gives generously, abundantly, faithfully. Whatever trial, whatever temptation, whatever hardship, Whatever sinful vices you're faced with, you're you're never left helpless. You're never left with inadequate means of glorifying God in your life. There is always a way in every circumstance to please the Lord. What a gift. Have you ever watched someone grow in godliness or you've watched somebody endure something in holiness, and and you thought, wow, praise God, I could never do that. I could never walk that road. I could never persevere in the midst of that kind of a path. Actually, if you're in Christ, you can. You can. You could do that. Why? Why? Because God enables these things. God empowers these things. No act of holiness or faithfulness 
No battling of temptation testifies to the initiative within the heart of man, but it testifies to the faithfulness of God. So whatever trial, whatever difficulty, whatever sin, whatever temptation, whatever hardship that is before you, take heart. There are divine resources for you to persevere faithfully and in godliness. God works in his children. Every person's endurance isn't found within themselves. God is at work in them. And if you are in Christ, you can press forward in holiness because God's power is in you also. Maybe you felt this. I know holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's can be a difficult time for many. Trials, reminders, hardships, sorrows, struggles, unmet expectations, broken relationships, whatever the difficulty might be. The the trial may seem, may feel too hard. The temptation is too fierce. The hurt is too deep. I can't do what God asks. Listen, beloved, the Lord is faithful. He is faithful. There's always hope to obey, to honor God in every circumstance. And that should be our ambition. Not to get through trials. Not to get past hard seasons. Or hardships. But in everything How might I glorify God in this? If that is your heart disposition, if that is your cry, you can have complete confidence that you will be able to achieve that. Not because it's in us that we got to conjure it up somehow, but because God is faithful and he loves to give to his children generously what they need to glorify him. And what is so sweet is that if And when you fail, his grace is still present. You're not under condemnation. He still loves you. And he's right there ready to give you what you need for that next step forward to walk forward in obedience. Being in Christ means you're no longer enslaved to sin. You've been given divine enablement to not sin. God's divine power has given to us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1.3. This reality is, is why we praise God when someone walks in obedience, right? If somebody shares, hey, I, I've really been growing in uh, my sanctification in this area, we don't go, oh, praise you. <laughs> praise God. Why? Because God enables it. God empowered them. God is the one who deserves worship for that and praise. God's doing it. Their obedience isn't an evidence of their, their obedience is an evidence of God's grace at work in their life. And what is the ultimate goal in all of this? What is God after in our spiritual growth? Well, it's that this holiness obedience would bring him glory. God being the initiator to will and the fulfiller to work in the believer, when the believer walks in this, God gets the glory. The responsibility is on us and the ability flows from God's gracious, loving enablement. And it is for God's good pleasure. It brings God pleasure to enable his children to both desire and walk in holiness. God possesses a saving impulse in his benevolence, not based on any merit or attractiveness in us, but simply out of his own nature. And it brings God joy to save and then to work in this way in his people. And when the believer, when we join our wills to his by his strength and obey him through his power, we enter into this joy with him. And it is far better than any fleeting passing pleasure that we might experience in our rebellion and defiance and disobedience against him. Second Peter 2.11 tells us our flesh is waging war against our soul. The struggle is real. And maybe you're in that struggle now. 
Or maybe you aren't feeling the struggle because you forgot you were at war and you have been content to entertain or allow various sins in your life unaddressed. Whatever place you are at today, there is a clear call here for each of us and it is to take sin seriously and to take heart. If you're in the fight against sin and would like help, one of God's means of grace in the believer's life and his spiritual enablement for believers to grow in Christ is absolutely the body of Christ. Don't be ashamed to confess your sin to one another in small group. If you're not in a small group, you should be. You should be able to be accessible to care for others in this way and you should be humble and accessible to be cared for in this way. Don't be ashamed to confess your sin to one another in private conversations with one another. One another. And listen, seek out one of your elders. You, you are so, so blessed in the spiritual leadership that you have in this church. The godly shepherding impulse and care that you have before you, the resources, the spiritual resources that you have in the godly men of this church who pour themselves out in love to be available to help advocate and promote godliness in your life is unparalleled. It is such a gift from the Lord. Don't be shy. Go to your elders. Say, I'm working on this. I need help. I know they would love to be available to serve you in that way. Let us, by God's grace and God's power, walk and live our lives for God's glory. Would you pray with me? Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that it is to be together this morning. And as we even ponder what awaits us this next year, 2023, Lord, I pray that each of us would have the desire to be found more holy at the end of this year practically than we started today. Lord, we can even have a confidence in that prayer if we are in Christ because we know that the strength and the power, the enablement to do so doesn't flow out of us setting up enough resolutions in just the right way to accomplish the right things, but the power flows from a holy, omnipotent, faithful, good, holy, righteous, compassionate, loving God who desires the holiness of his people, is committed to as such, and provides divine enablement. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be intentional in our pursuit of godliness for your glory. Help us to enjoy all of the blessings that flow from a a godly life intimate with you, experiencing freedom of of conscience, of a clean conscience before you. Lord, we know that there is unique usefulness for those who pursue and cultivate godliness of life. And so, Lord, help us to have as our ambition to please you in all things, to be useful to your purposes in whatever our circumstances dictate. Help us to yield in obedience. Help us to trust. Lord, we knew we know that every act of obedience, every impulse towards righteousness, every victory over sin, and every adherence to your standard and your instruction, it is not us. It is your work in us. And so we rejoice and we praise and we look to you out of love and gratitude. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.